Welcome to the Bluff the Sport podcast. My name is Lee Davy, and today my guest is Dara O'Kearney. Now, it was really good to get Dara on the podcast because I am really full of admiration on what he's done, right? He has carved out a career in the poker industry in multiple different avenues, not just playing. He is a top class author, he is a top class coach, he's a top class podcast host, right? He's won Global Poker Index Awards. He's done it all, right? And he started in his 40s. He was 42 when he first started to play poker, right? So and then we talk about that a lot in today's uh, podcast, which I think is really important to any of you who are harboring hopes and dreams of becoming a professional poker player or finding a niche within the poker industry, getting out of the matrix and getting into the poker industry. And that is what me and Dara talk about. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to shut the hell up and leave you in the cable hands of one of Ireland's best, Dara O'Kearney. Dara, the irony is not lost on me that we are both so-called podcast experts and we couldn't even talk to each other for the first minute. Yeah, it doesn't matter how many times I do this. This seems to happen every time. <laughs> you have a lot of books behind you there. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I see those ones, poker ones. Boring poker books. What about, yeah, boring. What oh, you mean the, 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 the real poker, the real books behind yeah, 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 yeah. It's an eclectic mix, my book uh, thing. It's all my interests. So it's like stuff like lots of poker books, lots of Bowie books, lots, of, but then lots of general literature as well. Um, because, Go to uh, the second shelf from the top, five in, and grab that book. Second shelf from the top, five in. <laughs> What we got? Samuel Beckett. Oh, tell me about Samuel Beckett. Why'd you buy that book? Uh, Beckett's my favorite writer um, mm. by far. Uh, I I discovered him when I was, I don't know, in my early 20s. And I kind of had this image of him that he was like very highbrow and boring and dull. And then I just picked up uh, one of his books. Um, and I was just amazed by how funny it was. Uh like it's just really, really funny Irish humor. Um, not at all highbrow, really. Uh, although he's obviously covering a lot of philosophical things, but he but he does it in such a humorous way. Uh, I was completely hooked. Uh, it was it was um, Murphy Malone dies in the unnameable. It's a trilogy uh, of books, and um, it's it's just there's just some hilarious lines in it. Like the, 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 there's a recurring theme, for example, with Murphy that like there were two things two. Two two times that Murphy hated day and night, or there were two types of people Murphy really hated: men and women. This, this just keeps <laughs> going back in the book, and you just get this impression of like a really grumpy individual who, uh, who 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 struggles to get through life, which I guess was Beckett's view of the human condition. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed Beckett. Sounds like I sounds used to like Dave Lapin. Oh, I mean, he's Lappin's favorite author too, for another reason. Lappin actually wrote his doctoral thesis on uh, on waiting for Godot. Uh, so, wow. um, yeah, it's 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 no surprise that he's our our favorite writers. And um, um, and actually, David Bowie, who I had a pen correspondence with for years, he was also Bowie's favorite writer. So he's very much uh, a sort of a, a cult. Um, writer among a lot of people i think he's very misunderstood people think he's like very dull and boring and dreary but actually he's very very funny what could uh what could beckett teach us about poker do you think uh just just to be completely stoical in the face of whatever happens that you you really can't control much and you just have to focus on on the little you can control and uh you know the, the the last lines of waiting for God. Oh, I can't go on, and then I will go on. That's pretty much it. Like you constantly feel like in poker that it, it punches you in the face so much that you can't possibly go on. But then you have to just say, "No, nope, I will go on." <laughs> what is what is it that um, that can you know continue to compel you to to move on through it? Because you know the it's, it's it's one of the odd things. Like I say this a lot when I'm interviewing people, but especially when I get to high stakes is um, people often want to leave the game. 
Um, mm. And I just, and, and okay, it's not a sport, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, there are similarities between sports and games. And normally when you fall in love with basketball or golf or football or whatever, rugby, you don't want to stop playing until it forces you out of it. But poker yeah. seems to be a little bit different for some people. Yeah, I think, I, I think well, it, first of all, it depends on your motivation. Like if your motivation is purely um, monetary or, or, or glory or whatever, you can reach a stage where you've kind of achieved enough of that that you that, that, that is just repetition. And, you know, that was something I felt more, say, in my running career, where I really, really wanted to win a race and I would throw everything into it. But then after I'd won any particular race, I could just never motivate myself that much for that race in the future. It's like, well, I won that before. Like, what's the big deal? It's just it's it's just repetition. So I think that's, that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, another aspect of it is just there are so many, you know, punches in the face you get. Like, most of your poker experiences are heartbreaking. Uh, as a tournament player, at least, unless you win a tournament, you're just not you're just not happy. Like the only person happy after a tournament is the person who won. Even the guy who came second isn't happy because he got so close to winning, and 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 so on down. Um, and so it, you you just get negative experience on negative experience piled on. Um, and I think that weighs people down too. I see a lot of people at the start of their career; they're really really optimistic people, and they're happy and and cheerful. And then it just gradually wears them down to the point where they're, they're just not enjoying it anymore I, I think maybe the reason that i'm the exception is like they, they were never really the motivations for me uh the, um the motivation for me was twofold first of all to get as good as i possibly can and i don't feel i've achieved that yet um i'm still constantly learning constantly improving um and secondly it's just like it's a giant puzzle uh it's a giant puzzle that i'm trying to figure out and i i haven't even scratched the surface and i you know i, I know i won't in my lifetime so there's the, the, there's no natural end. The other things that I did um, that I was very obsessed with for for you know years of my life, they tended to end either because I'd gone as far as I felt I possibly could in them. For example, you know, played a lot of chess as a kid, was obsessed with chess in my late teens, early twenties, and then kind of realized, okay, I'm never go. I, I'm I'm good at chess, but I'm never going to be a grandmaster. I'm not that good. Um, I've 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 plateaued. Um, with the running, it was, I mean, I guess the running was slightly different because my age started to tell against me in the end. Um, and it was clear that, you know, basically you, you, you can't defy the laws of aging. So that sort of put a natural end to that. But with poker, there doesn't seem like there's any end end point where I'll just go, okay, I've, I've gone as far as I can go now. And unless I, um, you know, start one senile or something and I realize that mentally I can't do it anymore. Um, but yeah, I think that's the reason for me. It's always been, it's, it's still so fascinating 15 years on. What's the, what's the difference between, um, plateauing in chess and not reaching that plateau in poker? Um, I, th- I think in chess, it's pretty easy. There, there, there's a very direct correlation between your skill level and your results, um, you know, the best player in the world will have the best results. And if you're not in the top 100 in the world, you, you'll you have at least 100 guys ahead of you who have better results. In poker, it's much more difficult to tell because, because variance tends to obscure everything. Um, and, 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 and because of that, you are constantly dealing with doubts as well. Like when you're running badly, you think, well, have I actually lost it now? Am I any good anymore? Um, and when you're running well, the, the challenge is not to, not, not, not to believe the hype too much and, and to keep working with your, to keep working to improve. So I think, I think the variance in poker sort of changes everything. And um, I think you kind of have to, I have to look at that from both aspects. Like when you're running badly, you have to just go, okay, well, I'm running badly, but that doesn't mean that I'm a bad player now. But also I think when you're running well, like when I had my best every year, 2015, I was conscious of the fact that the, the biggest difference really between that and other years was just, I was running better in, in key spots. I was winning, I was winning the flips when I was deep. Um, I was winning the 40, 60s when I had to, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so you don't kind of get carried away by your own hype. I think that's death for a lot of players. You see a lot of players, they, they, they come up, their arc is upwards. Then they have maybe a, a heater and they, you know, they, they're, they're world beaters. And suddenly they believe that they're like, uh, it was inevitable. This was always going to happen and it's going to continue forever. And then it doesn't continue forever. Variance kicks them in the teeth again, and they have to deal with the, with, with, with the other side of variance. And they just find it very, very difficult to adjust. Um, I haven't had the same sort of 
massive highs that a lot of people have had in their careers. Um, it's been it's been more a case of sort of steady um, steady results over a, steady consistent results over over a long period. Um, so maybe that makes it easier to deal with as well. I mean, maybe if I you know in a month's time if I won the World Series main event, I might get a completely inflated sense of my own uh, value as a poker player, and that might be the beginning of the end. <laughs> what what would you, what would you do if you won the World Series of poker main event? Into how would it uh, impact and change your life, including your multiple things you do in around poker? Um, I think it probably wouldn't change it too much. I mean, I guess there's some, there's some of the stuff that 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 maybe I don't enjoy too much that that, that I do primarily uh, for financial reasons that I probably just wouldn't do anymore. Um, but I like to think it wouldn't change too much. You know, it's, it's like that old joke of the guy who wins the lottery and when they ask him, what are you going to do about the begging letters? And he said, I'm going to keep sending them out. I, I think I would just keep uh, doing the same thing because for the most part, 95% of what I do is what I enjoy doing. I mean, if I, it's incredible I get paid for this, really. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievable because this is what I would like to be doing anyway. Uh, playing poker, writing poker books, talking to people like yourself about poker, um, all the all, all, uh, coaching, um, commentating, all the stuff that I do. I, I find it really enjoyable and I'm excited every day to get up to do it. Um, I think the real question is not what happens if you win a few million, what would you do? Because I would keep doing this because it's what I enjoy doing. It's the, it, it, Maybe a more interesting question would be if all the financial rewards went away, what would you do? Because mm -hmm. I genuinely love this. I kind of feel like I would do this even if there wasn't much money in it. Um, uh, and I'm having come out of something where, which was very niche, like uh, ultra running, where there's absolutely no money. And it used to annoy ultra runners sometimes to think, well, you know, we are the best in the world as something that nobody cares about. So therefore there are no monetary rewards. Whereas if we were equivalently good at football or golf or countless other sports, we would be multimillionaires. I'm just incredibly lucky that my favorite game, which is poker is, is also the, uh, the most lucrative. Hmm. I mean, maybe you're being a little humble there, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking about, rich role you know who went from alcoholic to ultra fitness super guy in his like mid 40s or whatever um and then he created an empire right now i'm not saying you've created an empire but when i look at dara O'Kearney, i see somebody who has looked at poker um, through a lens that says, I'm not just going to rely on the income that I'm going to get from the game. I'm going to expand those multiple income sources so I feel more comfortable and I'm able to, I can then try to figure this game out without worrying about the, the you know, the debt collector being on my case. Whereas I guess when you was a, a long distance, well, I'm guessing, I'll ask you, when you was an um, ultra distance runner, was you thinking about expanding what you was doing or was you just laser like focus on the running? No, the running was purely a hobby for me. I mm. I, I had a very um, lucrative career at the time in IT, so I didn't really think about running in terms of anything that had to make money. You at didn't all. need it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I basically didn't need it <clears throat> at all. And um, you know, the the IT career continued into the first first or second year of my poker career as well. Like I wasn't full time right from the start, um, but once I kind of reached the point where I knew realized I could make enough money from poker that I didn't need to do the uh, the other stuff, which I, to be honest, I wasn't enjoying anymore. Um, I, I, I it, it was just logical to step back from the other stuff and not do it anymore. Um, and then there was a sort of a I mean, I ran very well at poker, in poker at the start, but online and, and and particularly live. I mean, I won my first ever big live tournament, which is just ridiculous. Mm. And I wasn't even a tournament specialist at the time. So uh, ran extremely well for the first year or so and, and probably got a very false impression of both my own ability as a player and how easy it was. <laughs> um, and and then had a, had a bumpy few years where I... I was essentially very, very close to bust. I was barely keeping the wolf from the door. And, you know, unlike most poker players who come into online poker, where <clears throat> if they're living at home with their parents, they don't really have to worry too much about bills or not. I still had a family to support at this time. Um, so there was significant financial pressure on me to make sure that I made a certain amount every month. And uh, that led, I think that led to a sort of a quick education, first of all, on variance reduction, um, bankroll management, 
game selection, all the other stuff uh, above and beyond just how good you are at poker uh, that you that you need to sort of guarantee a steady stream. But then I'm looking around a couple of years into the poker career. I remember looking around and just looking at how many players just kind of fade away and disappear. You know, they, they might shine very brightly for a while and then three years later, they're gone. Myself and David often talked about this, the three-year cycle. If you go back three years and if you take the top 10 players in the world or in Ireland or any any subgroup now, and you go back three years, there won't be that many uh, who were there three years ago. And if you go back another three years, again, there'll be a total changing of the guards. And what I did see was that as, as guys sort of reached the point where they weren't making much money from poker anymore, they start to, that was the point at which they started exploring other avenues. You know, suddenly they became a coach um, or, they, or, or, or they were doing something else to try and raise money. But I always felt it was kind of weird that like a guy would turn to say coaching um, when he wasn't a winning player anymore. And therefore there was a certain lack of credibility there. It was like, well, the only reason you're doing coaching now is you need money and, uh, and you can't make it from poker anymore. And, and so I always thought, well, you should do that stuff before you actually need to, <laughs> before, <laughs> be, 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 before you're actually washed up, actually start doing that stuff. So like right from the start, I was thinking in terms of, uh, let's do a bit of podcasting. Let's try coaching. Let's do a bit of staking. Let's do all the other things, all the other stuff. It wasn't so much about the money in the early stages. It was just about diversifying. Um, but it, over time, it became much more important because, um, well, all of those uh, activities became more, I became more successful at them, uh, with, with the exception of staking, which I, I pretty much wound up. Um, but, but you know, the coaching, the podcasting, um, the writing, et cetera, et cetera, all, every year I was making a bit more money from each of them. And, at the start of my career, it was just a tiny percentage uh, of my overall income. But as time went on, it became a much more significant percentage and also much more reliable percentage. And mm -hmm. I kind of reached the stage where I realized that it's actually above and beyond uh, whatever, the whatever the money amount is, just knowing that that money is coming in also kind of frees you up as a poker player where you don't really have to worry about the downswings anymore. Um, you know, a 20K downswing when poker is all that you do and you're operating off a 50k bankroll, let's say that's 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 extremely stressful. But if you have a 20k downswing when you when you know you can get that 20k from lots of other streams over the over the next few months, then it's a completely different thing, and it, and it, it frees you up basically. Hmm. Yeah, I remember when I when I decided to be a, you know like most people say before you go to be a professional, make sure that you are earning X amount of money for X amount of years to prove that you can yeah. do it. Uh, yeah, mine wasn't like that. My, my, my <laughs> mine was like, I love this game so much. I, I just remember I was in the pub. It was uh, five o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and my friend, Terry the Run Welsh, who's like the local drug dealer in the valley where I live, he was like, isn't it a shame we can't do this forever? And I was like, Terry, you do, right? Like, <laughs> you do. I don't. I got to go to work. And I went to work and I was thinking, man, he's got something there. Uh, and within a week, I had... Deci I decided to take redundancy from a 20-year railway career and I was just going to be a professional poker player. Um, and then I'm going to add, like, I, I did something similar to you. Like, uh, well, mine was more strategic. I wrote, like, a big mind map and said, how am I going to make all this, all this money? But suddenly I got into writing by accident and I ended up um, blogging uh, for Poker News, the European Poker Tour. And suddenly that blogging money, it covered my bills. Yeah. And I can tell you what a relief that was because that yeah. then enabled me to say to my wife, I don't have to get a job now because this yeah. is paying the bills. And, that, and that's kind of what you're talking about, isn't it? That that bill paying yeah. money. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Like in, 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 in the difficult, let's say, second and third year of my career, I mean, basically, I said I had to make a figure and that figure was roughly 10,000 euro. So I had to make 10,000 euro from poker every month. And the only thing I was doing at the time was playing um, and I was playing sit and goes. Um, so I was playing hundred euro sit and goes on, on iPoker, poker. And every month I was starting with whatever amount of money I had in the account. And then I was grinding as hard as I could to make sure that when my wife came at the end of the month and said, okay, we need this money on our bank account now to pay all the bills. I was able to send 10 K, but there was this incredibly stressful thing of where like I would start with 2 K I build it up to 12 K. Then it's the end of the month. And now 10 K have disappeared again. And now I'm yeah. back down to 20 buy-ins. And I was like, this is, this is just, uh, and this is only a couple of years after 
you know, I, I I essentially didn't have to worry about money because I had a very good job. And um, I was like, is this, re- is this really what I should have done? Uh, so I, that was probably the point at which I started thinking, well, there's, there needs to be some other way to be getting money in rather than just having to win it every month. Because uh, even, even, even something as low variance as sit and goes, there is still variance. And you can't really guarantee that you're going to, that, 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 that I'm going to keep pulling it off. You know, the, the, the month will come where she'll come and say, we need the 10 grand. And I'm like, well, sorry, <laughs> bad month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <My ace got wrecked. laughs> yeah. I mean, wow. You're taking, you're taking me back now, like in, in to, the, to those times when it was really tough, you know, I mean, I remember the day that I, when my alarm clock went off and I didn't have to go to work because I, because I called them that day and said, can I leave? And they said, yes, do not yeah. come back because of the position I was in. So I was on gardening leave. It's not that they didn't like me. It's like, do not come back. We will bring your stuff in a box. We don't want to see you again. I'm like, okay. I woke up the next morning when the alarm went off and I started crying. I was so I was, I couldn't believe the freedom in that morning. No more people were going to trap their fingers in wagon doors. No trains were going to be delayed. No one was going to shout at me. And I was just like, wow, this is great. But then what came with it as it continued was an absolute fear and terror of going back to that life. Did, yeah. did you ever experience that? Oh, absolutely. I was, I, I mean, two or three years in when I was struggling, uh, you know, people might say, well, did you, maybe you should have gone back. And, but the thought of going back absolutely terrified me because mm. I had enjoyed the freedom so much, exactly like you said, just getting up and, and, and not having to deal with the boss. I mean, I was thinking about this even the other day, like just watching something on TV and people dealing with bosses. And I was like, I just couldn't do that anymore. Mm. Like constantly through my career, I had I had some very good bosses, but I had some terrible bosses as well. And they were stupid and incompetent. And you still had to do what they said, even though it was clearly the wrong thing. And you could argue with them and you could say, look, this is why it's wrong. And it didn't matter. They were the boss. You had to do it. And I that, that just drove me mental. And also the whole inter-office politics of uh, who, who you get on with and all this stuff. I just found that in- increasingly uh, uh, grating on me. And I remember, I mean, we moved here about 20 years ago. Um, and this, this is the first house we owned and it's on the outskirts. So I used to have to walk to the, to the train station every morning, uh, to go into town to work. And I remember I was a few months into this. I just noticed that literally it was the same people every day coming out of the same houses. It was like an ant trail to the local uh, train station. And we were standing in the same spots on the platform and we were, we were literally doing the same thing. It, it, it was like a... A, a, a bunch of robots or something. There was absolutely no individuality, nothing at all. And I thought this is a terrible way to have to live the rest of your life. Um, and I, like, I've always struggled with sort of being told what to do anyway, and being told and and, and, and being regimented in the sense that you have to be on this train at this time and you have to be there at this time. Now, and the reality is, that the, I mean, the irony is when you get into poker, you have to do a lot of that stuff anyway. I mean, you know, appointments are set. Uh, myself and Dave have to interview people when, when when we do for the chip race and all this stuff. But but it still feels freer because we are the ones who are saying, okay, we'll do this at three o'clock and we'll do this at four o'clock, et cetera, et cetera. And I honestly don't think I could go back to that old life. It absolutely terrifies me. That I'm, I'm glad I've reached that stage in my career now where even if poker stopped tomorrow, I wouldn't have to go back to that because I honestly don't think I'd be able to hack it. Um, and I do sometimes worry about the young guys who have never experience that and don't understand just how much of an antithesis it is to the poker life <laughs> because a lot of them have a sort of an idea oh i'll just go and find get a job and or or the other or the other great one is i'll start a business um because obviously they're all great businessmen just because they're good at poker and it almost never works out and they end up ha- having to work for somebody else and that's that must be terrible. I, I, I can't imagine what it must be like to, you know, have become good at poker at the age of 20, maybe had 10, 15 very good years, and then you reach the point where you can't do it anymore and you have to go off and get a job. That just seems so depressing. I saw a documentary once about the 19, I think it was the 1978 FA Cup winners, Manchester United, about what the players ended up doing. And like some of them ended up as forklift drivers. And, and I was like, like, how can you go from that sort of, that adulation they had and the and the, the lifestyle they had and the career they had when they were top footballers to just driving a forklift around in your local factory. That must be so mind-numbing. It's it's essentially the the, the back to front of the way 
careers are supposed to work out. You're supposed to do the shit work when you're young and then you become more successful and, and, and you rise the ladder. But um, for those of us who get involved in playing a game or a sport, it's often the other way around. We have we sort of have our glory years in our youth and then and then there's this horrible period afterwards. Yeah, it's um, I mean, character comes to mind, you know, straight away. But when when you talk about young poker players coming straight into poker from school and then not knowing what to do later. It actually was very similar on the railway. So I joined the railway in British Rail, like, um, you know, pre-privatization. And uh, we used to say, we used to say to people who had only been on the railway, you wouldn't, have to, wouldn't stand a fucking chance in the real world. Like, this is not a real job. Like, British Rail is not a real job. Yeah. Like, nobody yeah. cares if you run your trains on time. And then all of a sudden, we got privatized. Like, your trains have to run on time. I was like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> and it was hilarious. It was hilarious. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, let's just talk about character a little bit. Because, um, you know, I would say in the last... Yeah, since, since a pandemic, you know, like, I, I got myself into um, more debt than I've ever got got to in my life um and all the indications were lee get a job right uh and i'm like no like i vowed i would never get a job i would never have a boss it ain't happening i'm gonna find a way out of this and that's why i didn't become a forklift truck driver yeah. i i think that's really important that that determination yeah. that character some might call it stubbornness but it's more than yeah. that right dara yeah Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, t- we tend to get what we settle for. And if you just get into your head, well, okay, I guess I'm going to have to be a forklift driver now, even though I hate it. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there are people who love forklift driving as well. And I'm not, I'm not hating on that as a profession, but I'm just saying that a lot of the people who do it, they just do it because that's the only thing they can do. And that must be absolutely terrible. Mm. Um, if it's, if, you know, if, if you really love driving forklifts, that's fine. But, but yeah, I think, I think, and I saw this uh, when I, when I worked as well, like the, the first few years I worked for, for a company and, and then um I was making a decent amount of money. And then I looked around and, the, and there were these other guys who would come in and they didn't work for the company. And I'd ask, well, what's the deal with them? And I was told, well, they're contractors. And then you get talking to them and you find out that they're being paid five times as much as you are um, for less work. And you're like, okay, well, I think I want to be one of them now. Um, and they also, <laughs> and, and they're also not, not uh, uh, answering to any boss. The thing which I found really difficult about the working life were, first of all, having a boss, that just never really sat very well with me. Just, you know, natural Irish rebellious person doesn't like being told what to do. And the second thing was uh, there were lots of periods where you you basically had no work, um, but you just had to come in and sit at your desk and pretend to be working. Mm. And that just drove me up the wall. Whereas if I was working on an IT project and then I'd be working on it, the contractors would be working on it. And then when the project was finished, they'd be, they'd be sent or they'd be let go and they were off onto the next job. And I'd be sitting at my desk waiting for the next thing. Um, So I thought, okay, well, I definitely want to be a contractor. And that's what I did for 20 years or so before poker. Um, and and, and, and that, that's why I was doing very well. But like, I saw lots of people who had come to the same realization that I did, that it's kind of bullshit to be doing the same job for 20% of the pay. And then you have to sit at your desk staring at a screen pretending to work um, for two or three months until the next project comes along. Um but yet they wouldn't move from it. They, they, you know, they were, they, they just kind of became ingrained. And it was like, well, this is what I do now. I hate it. And, and, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd see them get unhappy in so many ways, slip into alcohol, uh, slip <clears throat> into an unhealthy lifestyle and just gradually become worn down by life. And I could never really understand what it was because, you know, they, they clearly had the intellectual f- f- faculty to work out what the problem was, but yet they didn't have, whatever it took to actually change things. Um, and, um, you know, I started a staking stable with David Lappin about 10 years ago. And we both knew absolutely nothing about staking. And one of the conversations we had at the start, uh, this was something that I brought up. I thought, I, I thought, well, there's a kind of an inherent problem in staking in that if you stake a bunch of guys, let's say, and five of them do really well, what will happen is those five will make enough money and they'll go out on their own. Um, and the other five you'll be stuck with. Uh, and they're the guys who are probably not doing as well. And, and we talked about this. And then I said, actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, reconsider my point because I've actually seen in the, in, the, in, 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 in the corporate world where people clearly should go out on their own 
and would make lots of money. And yet they don't do it because they just kind of settle. Um, so maybe it's the case that players, even winning players, will want to be staked. Um, mm. And and David was like, nobody would ever be like that because, you know, we're not like that. So the biggest mistake people make is they think everybody else thinks exactly like them and 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 has the same view of the world. But that's not the case. Some, some people are not that pushed about money. Some people are, you know, they complain about their job, but they but but it's still more hassle in their mind uh, to go out and change it or there's fear of the unknown or whatever. And it's mm. the same in poker. Like we had, we had guys who were, who, who had made more than enough money to go out on their own. And yet they still wanted to be staked because they kind of enjoyed the security of, of being staked and not having to worry about uh, where the money was coming from and, and all that stuff. Um, but it's difficult for people like us, and, and I'm including you in this because you know we 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 essentially look at this from the outside and go like, well, what are you doing? Like it's it's clearly the right thing to get mm. out of the rat race to leave the job that you hate. So why aren't you doing it? Mm. Well, let's let's talk about this and, and for a little bit longer because I think this is really important, and it's no exaggeration to say there's somebody listening to this, that this conversation could literally change their life, right? In the next 30 minutes, right? I, I'm not exaggerating, right? Because I, I've been there and you probably have as well. So, you know, I have a, a company that helps people quit alcohol, right? Um, and I have my own method. It's called the Stride Method. And one aspect of that method, we call it the death effect. And it's, it's not something that I created. It was, co- it was from an evolutionary uh, biologist called Jeremy Griffith from Australia, right? Um, and the way the death effect works or the way that I teach that it works in alcohol is um, a little bit like this. I go see my mom and uh, my mom could say, um, do you want a pint? Like we could be in a pub. She's like, do you want a pint? I say, no, I don't want a pint. Why is that then? Why well, don't drink? Why don't you drink? Oh, well, the reason I don't drink is because alcohol kills 3.3 million people a year, which is more than war, murder, terrorism combined. Yet nobody ever talks about it. And I find that a real issue. I think it's the most destructive drug in the world. If you think about it, ma'am, every single kind of ruinous moment in my life, including infidelity, including thievery, fighting, nearly dying with 28 stitches in my arm, like divorce, um, a shouting and screaming at my kids. It's it's all been related to alcohol, right? So can you see why I don't drink? To which mum says, oh yeah, fuck, yeah, yeah. Drinking is really bad. It is a violent drug. And she agrees with everything. And then she says, so what do you want? And I'm like, oh, I'll just have a sparkling water. And she's okay, sparkling water for him and I'll have a pint, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the death effect, right? And yeah. what happens is we are programmed um, from birth to become addicted to alcohol. And that's one of my views, right? Uh, another view I have is we're programmed to not question the status quo, particularly when it comes around job security and a quote unquote job for life or something like this, especially if we got kids and stuff. So I feel that what pens people in and what pen me in is fear. And the way that that fear worked with me, Darren, and I'll just Uh, roll it over to you. The way that that fear worked with me is it blocked off any potential to think that there is anything different than the railway. So when people are looking at me saying, why isn't this guy leaving? I'm not even thinking, my worldview is this, there's no world other than the railway, right? So I know what got me out of railway (laughs) What got you out of IT? And any comments on what I just said, of course. Yeah, no, I no, I agree. I, I agree completely with that. And and like alcohol has, has always been problematic in my family. My dad was an alcoholic, um, although he managed to quit uh in his mid-30s. And one of my grandfathers was an alcoholic as well. And it's it it, it is sprinkled through our family, and the destructive effects are clear. Um, I mean, I was acutely aware of them growing up, which is why I think I probably never became an alcoholic, even though I definitely could have been, you know, in the periods where I drank heavily, I felt myself wanting to drink more and more. So I, I, I could see there was a slippery slope and I do naturally have a very compulsive and addictive personality anyway, but I've tried to sort of focus that on, 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 on stuff which will have a positive impact on my life rather than negative impact, be that my career, be that running, whatever, you know, running was originally taken up to sort of try and get back in weight because I'd put on a beer belly and, um, uh, that 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 was always the approach I was coming from. Now, in terms of what you're saying about you know people can see the truth and yet they don't act on it. I I, th- I think another aspect of this is most people are, are 
just very risk averse. They don't want to take any risks. So it seems like the safe option to just stick with what you're doing right now, no matter how, how shit it is. And you see this in poker as well. Like sometimes people come to me for coaching and we're going through a hand history and I'm going like, well, that was a fairly obvious uh, three bet shove. Why didn't you take that? And they were like, oh, well, you know, I didn't know the guy, the guy hadn't raised in, in a while and it just didn't feel great. And then you take to see another spot and go like, why didn't you check raise that? Like, that's a very good hand to check raise bluff. And they're like, ah, yeah, but I thought like, mom, if he doesn't fold and then that's quarter my stack, et cetera, et cetera. And just these constant decision points where it's, it seems risky to do something. And therefore you don't do it. But the biggest risk of all in life is is to do nothing. Um, Because if you do nothing, your life will literally be nothing. Uh, And you will get to the end of it and you'll go like, "Mm, maybe I should have done something at some point. I should have, I should have taken a risk. It's not the case that by avoiding all risks, you can, uh, you can win. You absolutely can't. It's not the case in life that by avoiding all these risky decisions, you can have a nice contented life because you won't. Um, you have you have to be prepared to take risks. You have to be prepared to accept that they won't always work out, but but enough of them hopefully will work out, and you'll and you'll stick with the ones that do work out, and you'll and you'll gradually improve your life that way, rather than just sort of trying to make the best of the horrible lot that you found yourself in and not doing anything to change it. Um, and but but I think that is a big part of a lot of people's mentality. It's like, well, my life is shit now, but I don't want to try something else because it might not work out, and. Mm. Um, Often you often the only time you see people change do do actual real changes when they're absolutely forced into it. Uh, you know, when a pandemic comes along or when they lose their job or or or, or something else. And then you talk to them five years later and they say, Oh yeah, that losing losing my job was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, whereas at the time it was a disaster. Um, but they often need that 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 kick start. Um so what I would say to people is like just 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 look at all of those examples and realize that you don't need to wait for that disaster to happen. You can you, you can you can give yourself the kickstart at any point. Um, and at the end of the day, like you, 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 your your failures don't really matter too much um, so long as you get up and and, and keep trying. Success comes from uh, not from just being successful at every single thing you try. Success comes from when you have a failure, accepting okay, well that didn't work. Now I'm going to try this. And then that doesn't work. And now I'm going to try this. And then and then this does work. And now, and now you're a success. Um, I, I saw that in, in, in the business world as well. Like the, by far the most important characteristic of successful business people was that they were able to pick themselves up after after, after an idea didn't work or a company went bust and, and get on to the next one. Mm. Um, and then eventually, you know, there was one guy I was very close friends with. I think it was his 22nd, 22nd idea that worked. And uh, but but then you know now, now he's the kind of guy that the news the newspapers write about is this incredible success right from the start. He he just had the he had the Midas touch. No, he did not have the Midas touch. He tried a lot of really shit ideas. He tried some good ideas that just didn't work, and he eventually stumbled on the one good idea that did work, and 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 that made his life. And and that's kind of what you have to. It's it's and I, 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 I you know bringing it back to poker. That's what poker teaches us. It doesn't matter how many tournaments you bust and how many tournaments you feel bad about afterwards. You just keep getting yourself back up, and and, and eventually that that one tournament where you run pure uh, does come, and and and, and then uh, you know poker news are writing about you as a big success. Mm, I think it's 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 well in addition to that. Thank you for that, Dara. You know, so uh, I you know, I do I do have another question on that. Um, when you was when you was in the matrix, right? So I'm I'm just thinking of you as Neo in the office, right? Like yeah. just you just like what the fuck's going on? But you're you're actually you're falling asleep. But you you again, like I said, you don't know there's another world out there, right? This is all you know. Um, was there a particular moment in your life where um, the uh, the Greeks call it a katabasis, right? Where you're in that hole. And all of a sudden you see the light into a new world. And now you, so this is before the risk take, right? So now you see, oh, if I take this risk, boom, my life's going to change. Did something happen to you? Um, well, well, basically I would say that the, the, that point was early in my career where I sort of, as I, as I said earlier, I saw contractors come in and I realized actually those guys have a much, have a much better deal than we have. And that's, that, that's what I need to do. And I got into that. And that was, that, I think that was a crucial moment because if, if, if I had gone too much further as a full-time employee, you know, I was only a full-time employee, I think for two years. Um, but having seen other people 
if you stay a bit longer, it gets very, very hard to change. You know, mm. now you're married, now you have a mortgage, and now you don't want to take risks anymore. Now you have kids, um, et cetera, et cetera. So people just become more and more risk averse. I think you become a railwayman or you become a IT that's guy. It. That's, like that's, you that's what you are now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, but 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 then the second moment came, you know, 20 years later when I've done this for 20 years now, I've done very well out of it. I did enjoy it a lot for the first 15 years um, because just to give some background, typically what I did is I came as uh, came came in as an outsider to some new technological project. And there was a large, it wasn't just IT. Um, I worked in immunology, I worked in um, uh, circuit board design, et cetera, et cetera. And I was basically the outsider who came in and they would say, okay, this is the way we do things at the moment, um, but how can we improve it? Um, and I had to, I, I had that sort of fresh eye, um, and I had to also get very good at the technical stuff. Talk to all the technical experts, and then talk to their customers and get and get from the customers what they what they were looking for, maybe where the disconnect was. Because the more expert people become in an area, the the more difficult they find they find to talk to normal people about that area, um, because so much is just. Uh, lost in jargon and they just assume everybody knows what they know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I was essentially the middleman, knew enough about the technology to know what was possible, what it could do, um, but wasn't that much of an expert that I was just going to the customer saying, well, this is the way we do things. This is, this is just ha- how it goes. I could actually go to them and say, well, what does it need to do? Um, and then go back to the back to the people on the other end saying, well, look, this is what it needs to do. And I think this is probably technically possible, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I found that very, very challenging at the start. And I deliberately tried to work in as many different areas as I could so that I sort of learned about all the different areas of technology. Um, but then 15 years in, there was it, it was starting to become much more repetitive. And I was spending most of my time in front of a screen. I mean, I, I laugh when I think about this, but two of the reasons why I went into poker was I thought I'm spending too much time in front of a computer screen and I'm traveling too much uh, for somebody with a family. Why don't I just do poker and that'll, that'll solve things. <laughs> do the same thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And instead, I'm you know I do poker and I'm traveling more than ever and 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 I'm spending more time in front of a screen. But but at least it was an it, 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 it was a fresh challenge and it was a completely new area. And I think it it, it happened more slowly in poker because I. You know, my my original idea with poker was, well, my running career is running down. Um, I'm not going to be able to do this for much longer because of my age. But given the type of person I am, I'm going to go out of my mind unless I find something else to be competitive at. So looking around, seeing poker on TV, seeing people of all ages, ages, shapes and sizes playing, going, well, that seems like something where age isn't that much of a factor. And I know that I'm good at games anyway from my background in chess and backgammon and bridge. So let maybe I'll try that. And I thought, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll put a lot of work into that on the side. And maybe by the age of 50, um, I'll be good enough to play in some of those big tournaments I see on TV, like the Irish Open. Um, mm. Obviously, what happens is I run insanely well in that first year. And by the end of the year, I'm making more money from poker than I am from my day job. Um, I'm already playing our biggest tournaments. I'm already going to the World Series. Um, people are already talking about me as one of the best players in Ireland. And I'm like, Okay, well, I guess this happened faster than I thought. So, um, so, so why do I need to keep working? Um, but I don't think there was even a plan that it would become the job uh, at the start. I think it was literally I saw myself as somebody who would keep on doing what I'm doing, even though I'm not particularly happy with it. Yeah. Um, but then I'll have at least I'll have this other release of this game that I enjoy um, and and I'm able to play now. It seemed like a great feeling when when I was like, okay, I don't need to work anymore. I could actually do this thing that I love and make money from it. And, th- and then there was that reality check uh, of the of the next two years or so, where th- there was that struggle I was talking about to make money. And you realize, oh well, if if it's the job, then you do actually have to make enough money from it, and that brings with it a, a, a whole new kind of pressure. And I know a lot of friends who you know went pro and they loved poker before they did. And then they went pro and they just really found the pressure horrendous of having to make money from it. So they went back to doing what they were before and then they went back to loving poker again. But they absolutely hated poker while they were a pro. Um, I mean, my friend Rob Taylor said this to me. He said the first 
two years I played, I didn't have a single losing month. My first losing month was my first year as a pro. Mm. And it really threw me for a, threw me into a spin because uh, it was like, well, this was, uh, I'm actually relying on this for money now. This isn't just beer money anymore. This is where the money is supposed to come from. And that brings with it a whole, a, a whole other kind of pressure as well. Um, so like I always say to people when they talk about going pro, just be aware of that, that it, it, it does fundamentally change when it becomes your job. Um, it definitely loses some of the of the fun aspect. Um, you have to do things that are not as fun anymore. You know, you can't play all the games you want. You have to be sensible and professional in terms of your game selection, your bankroll management, all that stuff. Because there isn't this outside stream of income which you're which you're constantly replenishing your your your, your funds from. Um, you know, you, everybody talks about bankroll management and. But the reality is, if you're a recreational player, you don't really have a bankroll. You have a budget. You have an amount of money that comes from the rest of your life, which you're which you're happy to spend on poker. And that can be constantly replenished. But as soon as you're professional, now you have a bankroll. And if that bankroll goes, you lose your job. Uh, it's not it, Poker players have this really weird relationship with money where we can't really think about the fact that it's money um, because then it, that, then it just freezes you up. Um, but... Uh, but you, but you need it to play. You need to be responsible with it. You also uh, need to generate enough of it uh, to be able to keep paying your bills. Um, but if you lose your money, if you lose your bankroll, um, I, I guess this is less true in these days since people can go off and get staked. But but back when I started, there was, there was pretty much no staking. And certainly, if you were if if you lost your bankroll, you were the last person anybody would ever stake. Um, it was it, it was like you'd lost the tools of your trade. Um, so, so because of that, we, we, you know, money is everything and nothing at the same time. Uh, it's it's everything because if you lose it, you've lost your livelihood, and you've lost your job, and you've lost your status as a as a professional poker player. And we do measure people's success in terms of how much they've won. Um, so it's it, so it's also the scoreboard, but it also has to be nothing in the sense that if you're thinking about the money all the time, you're just going to be paralyzed. Um, mm. And you know, my friend Fergal Nealon, who uh, went back. Uh, who left poker a few years ago? He's, he he to, told us on the chip race that when he played in a small side event at City West recently, and he was on a bubble, and Smidge came up to him and said, "Oh, I, I presume you'll be attacking the bubble now." And and he was like, "To be honest, Smidge, I'm looking at that min cash, and that 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 min cash is a is a is a fridge. Uh, that that's a significant amount for, it, mm. for me where I am right now. And mm. that's." Poker players have to be able to step back from that. But at the same time, you also have to realize just how important money is. Because if you become too blasé and you just blow through it all, um, you've, you've, just, you've, you've just, you know, you've lost everything. You've lost your livelihood. You've lost your ability to make money. Yeah. I, I, I think that um, emotional intelligence uh, is like super important around that time period. You know, I, I, I didn't have it, you know, like um, I, I was a boy running around pretending he was a man and, I would win in the cascade. I had this quite lucrative cash game just across the road from me in the pub. Um, and I would come home and when I won, I would slip a couple of fifties underneath my my wife's in my wife's purse. And then when I didn't, I'd be like a right mopey bastard moaning and groaning and not even talking about it. And you know, people say you shouldn't play with money you can't afford to lose. And I definitely was playing with money that I could not afford to lose for many years. And I think that's why suddenly the the structure of having something different to support that. I think, you know, for example, a great World Series of Poker for me. The, the worst World Series of Poker for me was like the first year I did Poker News as a blogger, right? I was like, I, I thought I was going to die. Like it was just insane. The hours, the, 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 the monotony, everything was just insane. But then the next year I did play, Work, play, work, play, work, play, work, and it and it it worked out quite fantastic. And what I would say to people listening to this who love poker, um, and then uh, you can have your your spin on this as well, Dara, is there's so much you can do in poker, right? So um, I got into writing by accident, and then actually writing became my railway. And um, I got into the matrix again and, and, and I was like, I don't, I'm not enjoying this. I, I'm not liking putting something out and someone saying what prick wrote this. And I, I just wasn't <laughs> feeling the vibe, you know? Um, and then something else come along like content creation. 
you yourself, coaching, uh, commentary, um, being a brand ambassador and getting involved in the structural workings and values of a, an online poker company. Tell me more, Dara, about how important that is. Yeah, it is important. That, like, you know, uh, we, we talked about earlier about how like I, I wanted to sort of diversify and have other income streams. And that sounds makes it sound like there was a huge master plan where I had like <laughs> coaching on the board and this is what I'm going to do to none, none, none of that happened. Every single thing happened by accident. Absolutely. Mm. Everything happened by accident. The podcasting, the coaching, the brand ambassador, the books, most of the time it was somebody else coming to me with an idea and saying, look, this might work. And I was going, yeah, okay, let's, let's give it a try. We'll see how it goes. Um, and one thing which I think we we, we both have in common, um, I suspect, is that we like doing things that we're very good at. Um, yeah. Like you are an extremely good writer. Like your your your, your poker writer is incredible. Your poker writing is incredible. Um, it, it 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 really draws the reader in. It's it's it, and it's absolutely unique to you. It's it it's something that you have. You're also a really really good interviewer. Um, and so I suspect that that also, in addition to the monetary awards, gives you the additional satisfaction of knowing, well, this is something I'm actually good at. And it's been the same for me. Like I've I've tried different things and. And as you said, like poker is kind of very much choose your own adventure. Uh, you can, you can, you know, you can go into commentary, you can go into coaching, you can go into writing, you can, you can try them all and see what works. And for the most part, I felt I was pretty good at all of these things when I started. With the with the, with the one exception of coaching, I thought I was an absolutely dreadful coach uh, when I started, and I was the most reluctant coach in the world. The only reason I was doing it was because I was running a stable which I'd started myself, and then I brought in David Lappin. Jason Tompkins and Dara Davey. And when you were staking people, you also had to coach them to try and improve them and get them improve, increase their win rate and get them to where they were very profitable. So we we always had these coaching sessions. And I always felt like, you know, I, I shouldn't even be here. I'm just terrible. Uh, David's a really, really good coach. Dara, Dara, Dara became really good, really fast. And they would, they would talk to a point with whoever we were coaching that day. And then they would ask me, well, what do you think? And... You know, my nickname in the group was player dependent because that was my group. That that was that was my go-to answer. I would say, "Well, it's player dependent." I mean, who, who are we up against? <laughs> it what depends. Do do? And, well, yeah, obviously, obviously, that's the answer to every question, though. Yeah. But it's not particularly helpful. Like, tell us what to actually do. So, I, I I think I was an absolutely dreadful coach at the start, and it was, and I certainly wouldn't have charged people for my coaching. Um, but then a few years later, when people started coming to me asking me for coaching, and I, you know, in the beginning, I kind of went, to be honest. I think you'd be better off getting somebody else. I'm I'm, I'm just not that good at it. Um, but then the solvers came along, and, and for me, the solvers were a game changer because if you think about when I started, like there was a few books out there, most of them are, are on the shelf behind, and they were mostly terrible. And they some of them had little tidbits of of knowledge in them that that were useful, but that was kind of how we all learned, and we just learned by trial and error and and playing, and then uh, and. And but the main way that people got better was they hooked up with other uh, poker players and they formed a kind of a brain trust and mm -hmm. they ran they advanced ideas at each other. That's why the Scandies got so good so fast. They have that natural communal spirit where they will share information, um, and and they'll they'll all improve together. Now I'm pretty social and I was able to put a so a good good group together here in Ireland. But you know it's Ireland. And um, and I'm, I'm, I, I was already of a certain age, so it was more difficult for me to, you know, my, my natural peers weren't the 19 year old online crushers. So I did OK in that paradigm, but um, but, you know, not exceptional. I wasn't that well suited to it um, or at least that well positioned for it, let's say. Um, and then, you know, probably the next shift is when the uh, the training sites start and everybody's watching training videos now. And again, you know. I watched as many training videos as the next one. I learned a reasonable amount from them. But again, I don't think there was any, I, I wasn't exceptionally gifted in extracting information from videos. So no real particular edge there either. Um, but then 2014, 2015, whatever it was, the solver start. Now with my software background, I, I was immediately, I took them like a fish to water. I was like, this is this, this, this stuff I know. I understand yeah. all, everything that's going on here. So I was a really early adopter to solvers. Um, and started working with them and also became very good. And again, this probably relates back to what I did before, where I would go in and I'd be faced with a massive information from experts and I would pick out the important parts and say, right, this is th these are the things we focus on. It was the same. I was able to look at solver solutions and go, okay, well, this is this is a jumble of data, but but here's the interesting point. On these types of boards, we check raise 
this type of hand because it's it, it it it's a double backdoor hand. It can turn a straight draw or it can turn a flush draw, and that means there are lots of uh, turn cards that can come where we can barrel again as a semi bluff, and we will hit the river sometimes with a really strong, well disguised hand. So that's why the solver is using these hands. So I became very good at extracting that information and passing it on to uh, to people I was coaching, and. Since then, I think that's been really my main focus uh, or my main function as a coach. Um, I got good at coaching because I got good at understanding solvers and interpreting solutions for people to the point where, you know, now I coach a lot of um, A players who are better than me. Um, and you would say, well, how can you coach somebody who's better than you? But, you know, I can run the solve. I can pick out the important information and they will actually go off and implement it better. Uh, and, and B, I coach cash players and I'm not a cash game player, but again, you know, I can run the solves and I can I can extract the 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 key heuristics or information. That's a long winded way of saying that the the only reason why I stuck with coaching is that I do think I genuinely became good at it. But I mm. think if I had not gotten good at coaching, I would have stopped. Similarly, mm. if the first book had come out and everybody had went, well, that's shit. Um, I would have gone, okay, Barry, we're not doing another book. I don't care how much money we made, not doing another book. By far, by far the most important thing was 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 how it was received and people coming up and saying. In, in in a very narrow poker sense, that book changed my life. I was a mm -hmm. I was a complete fish in satellites before. Now I'm win now I'm crushing satellites. And that sort of positive affirmation, okay, we did a good job there. That 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 that's what keeps me motivated to keep doing it. Um, not the money. Um, same on the um, on the brand ambassador thing, but that really came about as an ex almost as an accident. We wrote a myself and David wrote attack blogs on uh, poker stars after Barcelona EPT. 2016, 2017, sometime around then, when they basically just completely lost the plot and and they were just screwing recreational players over. Um, you know, they were gouging them for a rake. They were paying far too much of the field uh, to the points that people were just getting their money back. They were forcing to play in unpleasant circumstances. Um, and we were like, they've just lost the plot here. Recreationals are the key to the game. Without recreationals, there's no game. Um, you have to keep those people happy. And if a poker site loses sight of that, um, the game is over. Um, and, you know, Unibet read that and said, yeah, that's exactly our vision. Um, we, we, we want to make poker fun again for recreational players. So you seem like the guys to advise us on this. Um, so, you know, even that was kind of like just by accident as, uh, as well. But, you know, that was something also that I saw in my, in my former job, like you would see a company um, and there was an Irish company that came out of a, three guys who worked on a project together in college and they came up with a really innovative piece of software which took over a small niche of of the uh the software world and it was an amazing um piece of software and then they reached a point where they had they had they had sold to every customer they could possibly sell to and unfortunately the business model is first of all you try and sell as much of your product as you can then when you've when you've when you've plateaued, the only way you can keep making more profit, and this is one of the inherent flaws of capitalism, is you have to squeeze more money from your customers or give them a cheaper service, cut back on customer service, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the three lads who set it off, they were like, okay, well, we're out now. We've done our job. They, they sell to an American multinational. The American accountants come in and they go, okay, the only way we can do this is we have to increase prices. We're going to reduce costs, et cetera, et cetera. And then the whole thing just goes to shit. Mm. And before you know it, some other fresh new company has come up and they've taken over the market. And we've seen that in, in the poker industry. Poker stars seemed for a long time to be completely unassailable. And everybody was like, well, they're clearly number one and nobody's ever going to come near to them. But then, you know, Amaya came in, they did the same thing. Let's try and squeeze even more money out of our existing customers and, 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 and deteriorate the service uh, and degrade the service. And, you know, the, the, the customers eventually wake up and, and move on. Um, and that's what we were saying at the time we, we, uh, that, you know, you can't, you can't just, you, you, even, even if you have close to a monopoly position right now, which stars almost had in the industry after the demise of full tilt, somebody can still come up from the outside and they will if, 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 if you treat your customers badly. And I think you know, at the time, a lot of the people in stars were very angry with us because we were friendly with them and they, and they saw it as sort of a personal attack on them. But it really wasn't. It was just like, you no, know, the values of your company have changed. And unless they change back, 
you guys are doomed long term. And I think stars have changed back now, and they're you know they're much more customer oriented again. Um, but that's along with a way of saying the whole brand ambassador thing was an accident as well. It was literally us just going like, no, this is wrong. We've had enough of this. We're not we're not going to stay silent on this anymore. Well, you, you're pretty good at it because I think you're one of the longest serving brand ambassadors out there at the moment. Yeah, we, yeah, we were thinking about this. Like most of the value of a brand ambassador, uh, a friend of mine in Full Tilt told me it's a bit like a new car. Like once you drive it out of the uh, 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 <laughs> uh, out of the showroom, it, it's lost it most down, of its value. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the value comes from just announcing, oh, we have a new ambassador and it's this person. And then all the poker sites write about them and say, oh, this person's just signed for blah, blah, blah. And then six months later, nobody cares anymore. We've always seen our job much more uh, sort of ongoing. Um, mm. We want to ke- uh, keep keep getting attention for um, our, our sponsor unit, but also to keep advising them on this stuff. Um, like when new stuff comes up in poker, they will... You know, they will ask us, well, what do you think about this? Is this format going to work out? Is, the, is this a good format? Uh, what do you think about rebuys with really big add-ons? Like that's that that's a drum we beat for a long time. We were like, that those are terrible for the ecosystem because if you have a rebuy and then the add-on is way bigger and it costs the same amount, the pros quickly work out that the best thing to do is max later edge and take the add-on. Um, and then you've bought your chips cheaper. Um, mm. but the but the recreations come in from the start are getting screwed over. Um and so, so we advise Unibet on all that stuff as well. Uh, and Unibet do pride themselves on how healthy their ecosystem is. Um, and there are certain things you can do which seem to give you a short-term boost. For example, do a deal with a staking stable, which will, will then move all, your, all their horses onto your site and your numbers will go up. But they're terrible long-term. Um, because those players will just uh, go, will just take all the profit off the site. Play, uh, recreational players will stop playing uh, when once they realize they're losing their money much faster, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's one of the reasons why you know we might not be the highest profile people in the world, um, but I think we provide a lot of value to Unibet above and beyond just you know what we do for them in terms of the chip race and 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 getting them attention, et cetera. Well, Dara, you know, whether it was by design or whether it was uh, uh, by complete luck and variance, you know, just want to point out to the audience here before I give you one last question that you started playing poker. I think it was 42, something like that, right? So for for anybody listening to this, you know, who wants to get into poker, I know you'll hear a lot of people, maybe Dara himself would say, it's really difficult, don't do it, et cetera, et cetera. But just think of the expansive nature of the industry, not just... um, because me and Dara, we said we'd never have a boss. We we still have people that we have to do shit for, but we don't kind of look at them as bosses. It's kind of it's quite it's quite a, a good industry. Um, and age doesn't have to be the barrier, although it obviously gets difficult the older you get. Uh, Dara, um, oh, and one last thing: your awards. I mean, you've won awards for the things that you've done, which does raise your profile up and um, is a really good. Um, acknowledgement from the industry that what you're doing is being recognized. And I just want to second that. Um, lastly, what is your favorite bluff, Dara? I can't let you go off the bluff the spot podcast without telling me what your favorite bluff was. My favorite bluff ever. And this was, and this one immediately comes to mind. Um, it was from my very f- first um, major tournament, the European, the very first running of the European deep stack in Drahad in, I guess it was 2008. And the final table came down to, a bunch of unknown Irish players, including of which I was one, and um, and Joe Beavers, who at the time was uh, rightly seen as, as as one of the giants. You know, we already had the Hendon mob. He was the guy we saw in the Ladbrokes Poker Million, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I had a I cultivated a very very tight image throughout the tournament. Um, I'd even put thought into stuff like I'll, I'll, I'll go dressed in a suit so I look like a middle-aged businessman or accountant um, rather than one of these young online guys, which is essentially what I was at the time uh, as a poker player. I was an online player. Um, right. And um, I wore sunglasses to look like a nervous amateur and I did it, I did, did everything. So I, was, so I was playing this thing and uh, um, for the most part, I got away with murder in that, in that tournament. Um, people just didn't call me down um, because uh, uh, they, they they assumed I always had it. And there was, the, the, there was a spot where uh, Beavers raised the button and I had Ace King in the small blind and I three bet and he just flatted. And the flop came 10 high and 
I put in, I think about a quarter of my stack as a C bet. And he called and I immediately knew now he almost certainly has an overpair. Um, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the turn came another brick. And I was like, I'm looking at my stack and going, okay, if I, if I, if I just accept the inevitable here now and check fold, I'm going to be one of the shortest stacks. And it's quite funny looking back now, because I, I guess these days I'm known as a very good short stack player, but back then I hadn't a clue how to play a short stack. Um, I, 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 I was a limit cash player uh, online. So I was like, this, this doesn't seem like this is going to be a very good spot for me. So even though the card didn't improve me in any way, and, and even though he clearly had an overpair, um, I pushed in, I think, about half of my remaining stack now at this point. Um, and he tanked for a long time and he eventually folded and he told me, and I believe him because I don't see why he would lie about this. I told him he had Queens. I, I, he told me he had Queens and he just assumed I had Kings or Aces. Um, and that was really a turning point because it took a big chunk out of Joe and we all knew there was going to be no chop as long as Joe was at the table. He was just eyeing this up. It's like, this is the most amazing final table ever me and nine rank amateurs. And it also moved me in, into the chip lead. Um, and, and because my image was so good, um, like I literally just never got called. I never got caught, caught bluffing in that tournament. In fact, I don't think I got caught bluffing in Ireland for about a year into my <laughs> career. And the first time it happened, it was announced on the microphone because it was an all in. And there was a huge gasp in the room when my, when my hand was announced and everybody was going like, he must've misread his hand or something. Uh, he had ace four <laughs> off. He must've thought it was aces um, because I had this, this, this incredible image. Um, and it was something I very much exploited. Um, and like my first year, very much owed to the fact that like, I could just get away with murder. Uh, I didn't play very many hands, but when I did, I pretty much won them all because I either had the best hand or I just bluffed. Um, and I think Joe realized maybe half an hour afterwards <laughs> just how bad a fold it was <laughs> because he became visibly agitated behind me. He goes like, I had Queens there. That's just a ridiculous fold. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> yeah, wait, that, that was before uh, he was going to nip a, a long time before he could nip away to have a look at what you did on the stream. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. There was no live different. stream or any of that. Like, so he was, he's, so he was, and, and to be honest, I wasn't incentivized to lie to him. Like I didn't feel, I I very much like Joe and he's a great friend of mine to this day. He's an absolute mm. gentleman. Mm. Um, so I didn't want to lie to him either um, and say, you know, oh yeah, I had aces, don't worry. So I was just like, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, whatever, mate. Whatever. Yeah. It's subjective. It depends. It's player dependent. <laughs> it depends, exactly. <laughs> player dependent. You read was this player never bluffs, so therefore you made an insane fold. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Maybe that pair does bluff. Dara, it's been a lovely conversation. Really appreciate it. First time I spoke to you, actually, and I, um, I've really enjoyed yeah, our no, conversation. I'm so thrilled, yeah. Keep up, keep up the good work, and uh, we'll get together soon. You okay? too. You too. Absolutely. Big fan of everything you do, Lee. Thank you.